Hi, it's Katrina. There are people dedicating their lives searching for new discoveries. The hunt is on for Cleopatra's tomb, the quest for King Arthur, and even what lies in the center of the earth. Be sure to subscribe and let's go. The deepest hole. Give a guy a shovel and you know the first thing he's going to do is start digging a hole. I don't know why, it's just one of the rules of the universe. In China, a bunch of guys with advanced shovels are currently in the process of digging the deepest hole in the country. And the depths of this thing are going to astonish you. Eventually, the hole will reach the crust of the earth, a feat that seems like it should be impossible. China is currently digging a shaft that will plunge 36,417 feet into the planet, making it the deepest borehole in China. The drilling started in June of 2023. The project got underway deep in the isolated desert of the Tarim Basin, an empty and desolate place in China's Xinjiang region. The shaft is due to penetrate over 10 continental strata layers to reach rocks from 145 million years ago. But what's the point? Are they trying to burrow into hell? Are they hoping to carve a tunnel to the other side of the planet? As incredible as these ideas are, things are likely a little more scientific than that. China claims that the borehole is being made in an effort to study the deep earth. Technical expert Wang Chansheng claims that it's a bold attempt to explore the unknown territory of the world. Scientists guess that it would take 457 days to complete. It's no easy job, with pieces of equipment weighing over 2,000 metric tons. The drilling gear has to withstand the incredible temperatures of the deep earth, which are 400 degrees Fahrenheit. There's also atmospheric pressure to worry about. You know how if you go too deep underwater, you can get crushed like an empty tin can under a monster truck's huge tire? The same thing can happen inside the Earth, where the atmospheric pressure reaches up to 1,300 times higher than at the surface. Then there's the fact that they're doing all of this in one of the driest and hottest places in the world. Still, keep in mind that the Chinese borehole pales in comparison to the famous Hola Super Deep Borehole in Russia, which is almost 4,000 feet deeper. Exploring the Jungle The quest scientists are on right now in the Amazon is one you should really be paying attention to. An incredible urban complex was recently found in Ecuador that has changed human history. Scientists are still working to uncover the secrets of the world's most beloved jungle. This discovery was made at the beginning of 2024. If you've been paying attention to the channel, you may have heard me mention it already. But this is a deep dive, so you're going to learn a little more than normal. The new discovery represents the earliest example of farm-based cities at the foothills of the Andes and the Ecuadorian jungle. These are the largest cities of their kind found in the area. Scientists didn't release an exact figure, but still, the numbers are astounding. They discovered thousands of mounds, roads buried beneath the jungle, and agricultural fields. They did this using extensive airborne laser scans. It's all about the light detection and ranging, or LIDAR for short. This technology has dramatically changed what everyone can do from the air. Archaeologists can now equip helicopters with specialized lasers that scan the forest floor. You don't have to go out and start trekking with the machete anymore. Over the last decade, this technology has been used more and more. You may have heard about the Maya settlements found in the Guatemalan jungle in 2018. It was a huge deal, changing the way scientists look at the Maya Empire. You may have also heard of the Olmec ruins found using LiDAR technology in Mexico in 2021, or the ruins discovered in the Bolivian Amazon in 2022. Christopher Fisher from Colorado State University called it a gold rush scenario. In other words, so many new cities are being found throughout the Americas and in the Amazon that it's caused a paradigm shift in mainstream thinking. It's becoming clear that people occupied all of the jungles from Mexico to Argentina. People didn't just live in the jungles, they transformed the jungles. The ongoing gold rush to find more and more lost cities has revealed evidence of widespread occupation. Discoveries in the Upano Valley of Ecuador have shown at least five different cultural groups living near one another 2,500 years ago. But unfortunately, scientists don't know any of their names. That's how mysterious this all is. And the mystery runs deep. 
People these days think about the Amazon as a pristine tropical forest, but that's not the case. Christopher Fisher described the Amazon as an abandoned garden, which is right on the money. For over 2,000 years, countless civilizations transformed the Amazon, bending it to their will. Then, in the 1500s, they all disappeared. Many of these cultures disappeared because of the European invasion of the Americas, but not all of them. More and more evidence is revealing that civilizations were disappearing prior to European arrival. Something destroyed civilizations from Mexico to Peru. We just don't know what it was yet. Do you have any guesses? Let me know in the comments. And now for number 10. But first, I want to give a big shout out to Steven Rostin and Crystal Goodall. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Searching for Cleopatra. Now I want to introduce you to an amazing woman at the forefront of one of history's greatest mysteries. Her name is Dr. Kathleen Martinez, an archaeologist who used to be a criminal lawyer from the Dominican Republic. The lawyer turned archaeologist has been on the hunt for Cleopatra's tomb for years. Kathleen has gotten a lot of criticism and many think she's on a wild goose chase. But whatever you think of her, you have to admit that she's got guts. Kathleen left her marriage and moved to Egypt, all in search of the tomb of a queen who has been dead for 2,000 years. Kathleen is also the only archaeologist from the Dominican Republic who has practiced outside the country. But what's so important about Cleopatra that Dr. Martinez has dedicated her life to finding the queen's tomb? You likely know a few facts already, like that Cleopatra was said to be incredibly beautiful, ruthless, intelligent, and crafty. She married a few of her own brothers, she had a romantic relationship with Julius Caesar and had a son, and she was also with Mark Antony and they had children. But beyond her romantic pursuits and power struggles, there is one major thing that makes Cleopatra, the seventh of her name, so important. Cleopatra was the final chapter in ancient Egyptian history. She was the last great ruler of the Macedonian Ptolemaic dynasty of Alexander the Great. Alexander founded the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt in 300 BC. The family ruled for three centuries until Cleopatra died in 30 BC. Her death marked the end of the period we call ancient Egypt. She was the last pharaoh. After her death, Egypt was taken over by the Romans. You probably weren't around in 1922 to remember the hype surrounding King Tutankhamun's tomb being found by Howard Carter. And I wasn't either, obviously. But I can tell you how excited the world was by the discovery. King Tut's tomb was all anybody could talk about for years. But this was a 19-year-old pharaoh who nobody had ever heard of before. Imagine how exciting it would be if Cleopatra's lost tomb is discovered. People are going to lose their minds. Sadly, nobody knows where the final pharaoh was buried, but Kathleen has been focusing her search on the sprawling temple complex called Taposiris Magna. It was dedicated to the Egyptian goddess Isis and still stands west of the city of Alexandria. She might be very close. Kathleen suspects that the area could be the Ptolemaic version of the Valley of the Kings. It could be filled with the most important rulers of Egypt after Alexander the Great. However, no great tomb has been found. Dr. Martinez has discovered coins bearing the image of Cleopatra on them, strange underground passages, and empty burial rooms. She suspects that Cleopatra is here somewhere, buried underneath thousands of years of dirt. If Kathleen ever does find Cleopatra, she'll go down in history. Deciphering Herculaneum Artificial intelligence is at the forefront of modern archaeology. AI is doing things that scientists could have only dreamed of doing a handful of years ago. Take, for example, the investigations at Herculaneum, Pompeii's sister city that was destroyed in the cataclysmic eruption of 79 AD. AI is working to decipher scrolls that could have never been read otherwise. When Mount Vesuvius blew its top, Herculaneum was buried under layers of ash. The gorgeous Roman town was likely a place where only the wealthiest Romans could live. It had picturesque views of the sea and of Vesuvius. The views were great until they suddenly turned deadly. The town was buried, and it was lost until it was accidentally found by a farmer in the 18th century. Villas have been found in Herculaneum that belong to some very important people. These were the real VIPs of the Roman Empire. 
One villa in particular was home to Julius Caesar's father-in-law, Lucius Calpurnius Piso Caesoninus. For such a long name, it rolls off the tongue surprisingly well. When archaeologists started poking through the villa, they found the ruins of an ancient library. Over 1,000 scrolls had been kept in the personal library and were carbonized when the volcano erupted. They weren't outright destroyed, but were instead turned into carbonized ash. It's like a rolled up newspaper that's been thrown into the fire. The intense heat burns it to a crisp, but the paper keeps its form. Then when you try to touch it, the rolled up newspaper disintegrates. That's kind of what the papyri scrolls are like. They are fragile chunks of ash that can disintegrate into dust, but they are still legible if they can be unrolled. A few of them were unrolled by a careful monk who was able to translate some philosophical Greek texts, but most of them are impossible to read. Well, impossible without AI. Scientists at the University of Kentucky have created a program that can virtually unwrap each scroll. Instead of taking 500 years to slowly decipher the content of each scroll, AI should be able to do it in minutes. The team at the university deciphered 2,000 letters from the scroll using their machine learning algorithm. The project is still a work in progress, but should soon be able to recreate the lost Herculaneum library. Are you excited? I'm excited. Hunting for Sak Tzu. After decades of searching, researchers in Mexico believe that they have finally uncovered a legendary lost city. A city that was so great it spanned 100 acres of jungle. It was established about 2,500 years ago and played host to a fabled Mayan dynasty. But after it was abandoned over 1,000 years ago, all traces of the city disappeared. Since 1994, scientists have been trying to find the lost city of Sak Tzu. More than that, scientists have been trying to understand why Sak Tzu and other cities like it were suddenly abandoned in the 9th century. Sak Tzu and the other abandoned cities were major centers of commerce, religion, and politics. They were huge cities that were home to millions of people, yet within just a few decades, they were all empty. Ghost towns devoid of life, temples left in shadows, pyramids deserted, given over to wild animals in the jungle. It would be like if all of the major cities along the east coast of the United States suddenly went dark as the people fled. For something like this to have happened, even in ancient times, there must have been a good reason, right? Surely something apocalyptic happened. Charles Golden was the co-leader of the research team who discovered the ruins of the city. Although if I'm being fair, Charles shouldn't get all the credit. It was a grad student from the University of Pennsylvania who tipped him off, but it was a rancher who actually found the place. The grad student was passing a carnita stand while in Mexico when a local flagged him down. A cattle rancher had discovered a limestone slab on his property depicting Maya glyphs. The student passed the information on to Charles, who went to investigate. This led his team to an archaeological site called La Canja Celtal. Who would have thought some carnitas could lead to something this exciting? It didn't take long for researchers to realize they had finally found the city they'd been looking for. Excavations revealed a monument, and upon the monument were a series of glyphs. The glyphs read Sakti Dynasty. This was definitely the city that everyone was so desperate to find. Excavations are still ongoing, so there is definitely going to be more information in the future. Right now, Charles and his team believe that Sakti was once a powerful city-state. Sometimes the dynasty was an ally with other city-states, but other times they were the enemy. They were part of the Maya civilization, but were a private entity. They had their own politics, their own economy, their own royal courts, and their own armies. Sak Tzu was kind of like Texas, part of the larger culture, but a beast all its own. Before moving on, I just want to say one more thing. I want to give you an idea of how buried the city is and how easily a culture can be swallowed by nature. Archaeologists have only found the remains of some walls, plus a panel inscribed with poems, tales of a water serpent, and a mysterious flood myth. They have also discovered a skeleton of an adult woman from 2,500 years ago. For such a mighty city, Sak Tzu is completely buried. Everything is hidden under a thick layer of dirt and grass and bushes. And yet there were once pyramids here that touched the sky. Keeping it local. 1,200 Bronze Age burial mounds were recently discovered in the Netherlands thanks to a group of citizen scientists. 
If you've ever wanted to try your hand at archaeology, now is looking like an excellent time to do it. Citizen scientists and amateur archaeologists are making awesome discoveries around the world. The project is called Heritage Quest. It's a collaboration between the University of Leiden and a group called Gelderland Heritage. It allows ordinary people to look for archaeological remains in their spare time and in their local area. Citizens who have an interest in ancient history can learn more about their local past from the comfort of their own neighborhood. In total, around 6,500 people worked on the project. They found prehistoric field complexes from 3,100 years ago. They also discovered a series of charcoal kilns, which were once used to produce charcoal. But the most impressive finds were the burial mounds. Some of them have been dated to be 4,800 years old. None of this would have been possible without the effort of the volunteers. Their discoveries aren't revolutionary. They didn't find any tombs belonging to secret kings or anything that could change the course of history, but they did unveil plenty of grave sites and learned more about the ancient past. The main reason I wanted to tell you about the project was to give you a bit of encouragement. If you've ever wanted to get involved in archaeology but have been too nervous, look for any local project that's happening right now in your city. Who knows what you could find? The Quest for the Ark did you know that according to the Turkish government, Noah's Ark has been officially found? 30 years ago, the Turkish government declared Mount Ararat the official site for the remains of Noah's Ark. But is it true? This is the story of Ron Wyatt's tireless search for the Ark. In 1960, Ron read an issue of Life magazine that had a story about an expedition led by the United States of America to look for Noah's Ark. They didn't find any remains, but Ron was confident that he could. He spent two decades trying to prove that the Duru Pinar site was where the Ark came to rest. Now, feast your eyes on the pictures of Duru Pinar. It does look suspiciously like a boat, doesn't it? Ron believed the grooves that you see along the edges of the boat-shaped piece of dirt were left by the ribs of the ship's hull. Ron determined the ship to be approximately 515 feet long, which matches perfectly with the measurements listed in the book of Genesis. So was this a coincidence, or was Ron onto something? Throughout all his efforts, Ron didn't find a single piece of wood to confirm any of his theories. Ron was an interesting guy, even if he was obsessed with the Ark. He was originally a nurse anesthetist in Tennessee before he started on his mission. He gathered a team of physicists, engineers, geologists, historians, and even an astronaut. They used metal detectors, subsurface radar equipment, and molecular frequency generators. But all Ron and his company ever managed to find in over 20 years of searching was a potential iron content in the soil. There is so much iron in the soil that it could be evidence of a decayed metal grid, which was potentially used in building Noah's Ark. Ron passed away in 1999, convinced that Duru Pinar is where the Ark landed, and his mission continues to this very day without him. In 2023, researchers found evidence of human activity at the site. Researchers from Turkey and America have been hard at work processing data from the site since 2021. They tested pieces of soil, dating them to around 5500 BC. Their tests also showed that human activity was going on in the region at that same time. Even for a skeptic, the proof is intriguing. The mysterious mound of dirt looks exactly like a boat. It's the same size as the Bible says the Ark was. The mound is also exactly where the Bible says the Ark landed after the flood. The research is still ongoing, but a lot of people are convinced. How about you? The Queen of Sheba If there was one woman from antiquity who could give Cleopatra a run for her money in terms of beauty, mystique, and charisma, it would be the Queen of Sheba. The name hits a peculiar note in the brain, even for those who don't quite know who she is. Sheba is the mother of Ethiopia. She appears in the Bible, but nobody knows if she was real. The myth of Sheba starts with the Old Testament. The Bible says that the Queen of Sheba left her kingdom in Ethiopia around the year 1000 BC. She made a great journey to Jerusalem, accompanied by camels bearing spices, trunks full of gold, and other riches. When she arrived in Jerusalem, the Queen of Sheba was welcomed by King Solomon. Solomon's whole vibe is a story for another day. He was a man of great wisdom. 
He was the king of the Israelites and the son of David. Most people believe that he was a real ruler. Sheba tested Solomon with philosophical riddles, and ultimately, they went to bed together. It should be noted that Sheba appears in three main holy books. She is in the Hebrew Bible, aka the Old Testament, as well as the Quran and the medieval Kebra Nagast from Ethiopia. She's mostly the same in all the versions of her story, wise, beautiful, and from a mysterious land far away. The Queen of Sheba gave birth to King Solomon's son, whom she named Menelik. He became the first king of the Solomonic dynasty of Ethiopia. He later returned to Jerusalem to visit King Solomon, leaving with the greatest treasure this world has ever seen. Legend has it that Menelik took the Ark of the Covenant with him back to his homeland. Ethiopians believe that the Ark is still there, sitting in a small chapel in Aksum, guarded by only a few weaponless Ethiopian monks. Ethiopia has had a brutal time in modern history, but it never used to be like that. The ancient Egyptians called Ethiopia the Land of Punt. They believed it was an exotic world where the Nile River burst forth from great fountains in the earth. Medieval Europeans thought Ethiopia was inhabited by unicorns. They thought dragons breathed fire from the great mountaintops. I could go on all day about Ethiopia, both its history and ancient legends, but you're here to learn about the quest to discover the Queen of Sheba. The quest is still ongoing. There is a place that was recently excavated known as Queen of Sheba's Palace, an epic ruin that was definitely fit for a queen. The issue, however, is that the ruins are from the 6th century BC. The palace was built 400 years after Sheba would have been dead. In 2012, former curator at the British Museum, Louis Schofield, began excavating Aksum. He wanted to find evidence that Sheba was a real woman. While he didn't find the queen herself, he did find an ancient gold mine. Researchers think the mine could have been the source of the queen's wealth. The one consistent part of Sheba's myth is that she was the wealthiest woman in the world. It looks like the ancient city of Aksum, where she supposedly ruled, is sitting on an epic gold vein that's been completely tapped out. She may have truly been the wealthiest queen in ancient history. Still, there is no direct evidence of her life. Modern turmoil in Ethiopia has made it nearly impossible for archaeologists to do proper research. Her tomb could be here somewhere, hidden in the ruins of a palace that was lost for 3,000 years. But for now, the quest to find the Queen of Sheba continues. King Arthur Jumping from one mythical ruler to the next, I have some very important information regarding the hunt for King Arthur. Archaeologists recently began the first excavation of a mysterious tomb in England that's directly connected to the legendary king. The tomb is much older than King Arthur or the Queen of Sheba. It's 5,000 years old, a humongous stone that's barely standing in the West Midlands. According to legend, King Arthur got in a fight with a giant in this exact location. So, the prehistoric tomb is called Arthur's Stone. It's unlikely that the excavation will lead to the discovery of King Arthur's bones. The tomb is way too old, built by Neolithic Britons who are an even bigger mystery than King Arthur. Archaeologists suspect that Arthur's Stone was part of a much larger complex. It was a place where people came to gather, tell tales, feast, and perform rituals. Putting the tomb aside, the hunt for King Arthur is still ongoing. According to Hetta Elizabeth Howes at the British Library, historical records prove that a man named Arthur did exist. The name Arthur appears in Welsh accounts from the 5th century AD, precisely when he was supposed to be alive. This mysterious Arthur character led a resistance against the invading Saxons. He is described in the records as a gifted warlord. What historians struggle with today is distinguishing fact from fiction. Yes, historical records show that Arthur existed, but was he a warlord or a legendary defender of the realm? King Arthur morphed into an almost supernatural figure in the 12th century. Manuscripts were shared between wealthy nobles. Arthur became stronger, his legend became more fanciful, and he befriended wizards. By the end of the 13th century, Arthur was much more than a rebel leader. He was the biggest hero in the history of the British Isles. By the Middle Ages, King Arthur was having a major impact on society. His tales became part of a medieval romance tradition. 
People may yearn for a simpler time today, wishing to go back to before smartphones and the internet. But people did that too in the Middle Ages. 500 years ago, people yearned for a simpler time. They wanted to go back to the days of King Arthur, which to us would be considered the Dark Ages. They wished to be alive when King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table spread morality throughout the lands. Maybe Camelot will never be found. Maybe King Arthur will remain a myth. And to be honest, maybe it's better that way. Maybe to know the truth of King Arthur would be to destroy his legend. And wouldn't that be a tragedy after all these years? The City of Gold The Lost City of Gold It's a phrase that gives you chills right off the bat. But there are a lot of different cities of gold. Cities that explorers have died in search of. El Dorado and the Lost City of Z, for example, just to name a few. Another lesser-known city of gold is Paititi. It's a place of mystery and death that's supposedly deep in the Peruvian jungle. So many people have disappeared while hunting for the lost city of Paititi that few believe it to be real anymore. Paititi is nothing but a myth, a tribal legend that stubbornly remains alive through countless generations. Or is it real? The myth of Paititi nudged closer to reality in 2015. French researcher Vincent Pellissier published an article online and a YouTube video claiming that he found the location of the lost city. Vincent said that he was organizing a mission. There were big stories about it in major publications, but then there was radio silence. Vincent claimed that he was about to change history by strapping on his hiking boots and journeying deep into the jungle. He had identified Paititi at the end of a lost Inca highway thanks to some screenshots from Google Earth. But he never found the city in person. In fact, Vincent vanished before ever setting out. In 2016, Forbes published an interview with Terry Jamin, who said he was taking a helicopter into the jungle to where he believed Paititi awaits. But it never happened. And he hasn't been heard from since 2018, after another failed expedition that never got off the ground. The search for Paititi is the closest modern equivalent to the failed hunt for El Dorado by the Spanish conquistadors. But what is it about this place that still has people desperate to find it? Paititi is said to be rich, filled with more treasure than you could spend in a lifetime. Inca legend says that the Ero Incarri, who founded the capital of Cusco, retired deep in the jungle. Encarri founded a city that was so difficult to find that it became a legendary Inca refuge. When the Spanish started to tear down the Inca Empire, Paititi was their last stronghold. The bulk of their treasure was transported to the city, located somewhere at the edge of Peru near the border of Bolivia and Brazil. The Spanish never found Paititi. Nobody has. If the legend is true, its ruins hold more treasure than has ever been found in the ancient world. It could even be home to an Inca culture living in total isolation deep in the jungle. There have been a lot of expeditions. Percy Fawcett himself went to look for it in 1925. And before that, the Spanish sent expeditions to retrieve the treasure. Juan Álvarez Maldonado went hunting for it in 1570. So did Gregorio Bolivar in 1621. But none of them were successful. A big clue was revealed in 2001. Italian archaeologist Mario Polia found a document in the Vatican archives. It was a report written by a missionary named Andres Lopez in 1600. Lopez described an epic city deep in the tropical jungle called Paititi by the natives. The city was so rich in gold and jewels that Lopez demanded that the Pope be informed of its existence. The city was such a big deal that when word reached the Vatican, they tried to erase any mention of Paititi. They kept it a secret for decades and stored Lopez's letters in their secret archives. All these years later, the search is still ongoing. Maybe Paititi is real, and it could just be a matter of time before someone discovers it. The Madaba Plains Project Chances are you've never even heard of the longest ongoing archaeological project in the history of Jordan. It's called the Madaba Plains Project. For 50 long years, scientists have been hard at work excavating three major sites. If you've heard of any of these places, I'll be seriously impressed. The three sites are Tel Hizban, Tel Jalul, and Tel Umairi. 
Each one can be found east of the Jordan River in a swath of agricultural land that was occupied as early as the Bronze Age. 2,000 students, professors, archaeologists, and other experts from across the globe have participated in the ongoing project. Some were around at the beginning, like Professor Emeritus Bert de Vries from Calvin College. He was there at the start in 1968. 50 years is a very long time, so what have they uncovered throughout their research? Too much to list! However, a few things have proven to be more impressive than others. For example, a massive defensive system was excavated at Umairi from 1600 BC. It was a mighty fortress that protected the city from outside attacks. It goes to show how brutally violent the region was even six centuries before King Solomon. There is also a temple in Umairi from 1400 BC, proving the significance of early pagan religions. Archaeologists have found evidence of tribal groups settling, as well as the rise and fall of small kingdoms. The site of Telhisban includes ancient temples and reservoirs from Roman times. The site also has the remnants of Islamic buildings from the 7th century AD and later ruins from the Mamluk era of the Middle Ages. The Pompeii of the North Archaeologists are currently working to excavate the mysterious city known as the Pompeii of the North. It's 2,000 years old and is described as a magical place by researchers, yet it's barely been touched by hammers and chisels. The ancient city of Claterna is only 10% explored. This amazing place is located in Bologna, where it served as a cultural hub during the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. The city was founded around the 2nd century BC. Miraculously, it survived the fall of Rome, only descending into ruin around the 6th century AD. Take a look at some of these excavation photos. It doesn't exactly look like a magical city, does it? It looks like a bunch of dirt, an orange barrier fence, and a whole lot of fields in the background. If it weren't for the archaeologists slowly digging layer after layer, you'd have no idea that a city once stood here. As of right now, Claterna appears to cover about 44 acres. However, it could be bigger. 90% of it is still untouched. It's been compared to Pompeii because the whole city is buried and could be incredibly well preserved underneath the dirt. Researchers have already found over 3,000 coins, 50 gems, and offerings to various deities. There is a ton of work that still needs to be done here to expose the history of Claterna. It could prove to be one of the most important Roman cities in northern Italy. Did you have any idea that there are so many archaeological quests unfolding right now? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and thanks so much for watching! Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and stick around for another older video that you might have missed out. The Guanajuato Mummies In the small city of Guanajuato in central Mexico, archaeologists were shocked to discover hundreds of terrifying mummies with their faces still twisted in terror from when they died. When the science fiction author Ray Bradbury visited Guanajuato back in 1947, he described the mummies he saw there as shocking and horrifying, claiming that he had nightmares after his visit. The story behind the mummies goes back to the 1850s, to a time when the world was stricken by a horrible cholera epidemic. Death rates in Mexico spiked significantly, so much so that they started running out of room in their underground crypts to put the bodies. As a result, they began burying the dead in new crypts above ground, but by 1865, the government had instituted a burial tax. This forced families to pay money to keep their family members buried in the ground. When the families couldn't come up with the taxes, the bodies of their loved ones were excavated and moved into a storage facility. It was when people stopped paying the tax and the bodies started being excavated that the first Guanajuato mummies were found. People were appalled to see that they still looked the same as when they died, twisted in their final moments of horror. In one case, the mummy of a woman was biting into her own arm. It was believed that she had most likely been buried alive when symptoms of her disease made her heart appear to have stopped. There was also a mummy of a woman who died in childbirth and her 24-week-old fetus. It is no surprise that Ray Bradbury was inspired by the gruesome and awful things he witnessed in Guanajuato enough to write The Next in Line, a story about evil supernatural sources. French Massacre Archaeologists have discovered the mutilated remains of victims of a genocide in northeast France. But this was no recent genocide. It was a massacre that happened 6,000 years ago. 
Researchers uncovered 10 bodies inside an ancient pit, with the Neolithic people inside clearly having suffered horrible deaths. They showed proof of cuts all across their bodies, including deep lacerations to their heads. The bodies were also lumped together in such a way that suggests they were thrown into the pit haphazardly and without care. According to Philippe Lefranc, one of the archaeologists working on the case, these people were brutally executed, probably by some kind of axe. The remains included the bodies of five adults, an adolescent, and the arms of four other different individuals. These arms were likely war trophies, a fairly common practice at the time. The main theory right now is that a group of warriors from the Parisian Basin attempted to raid the area of Alsace, where the bodies were discovered. The raid, it seems, failed miserably. Ultimately, however, archaeologists say that the Parisians eventually successfully replaced the Alsacians by 4200 BC. The evidence can be seen in the changes in cultural artifacts of the time. Haunted House Fail There's nothing quite as creepy as the stuff you find in an abandoned house. But in Norway, South Carolina, things got extra ghoulish when a group of friends broke into a haunted house and stumbled upon a dead body. The group of friends had been driving around on their ATVs in a remote area when they came across the abandoned home that was rumored to be haunted. Naturally, they had to go in and check it out. At first, everything seemed the normal amount of creepy. The house was full of old junk, it clearly hadn't been lived in for quite some time, and it looked as if the Blair Witch may have been using it as her forest hideout. But as the group of teenagers rummaged through the house, they couldn't help but notice the putrid stench of rot that followed them everywhere. When they went to the back porch, the smell of rot was even more powerful. The only thing on the back porch other than a pile of garbage was a deep freezer. When they bravely opened the freezer, they saw a dead man in blue jeans and socks. They immediately ran away and called the authorities. Local deputies never were able to confirm the identity of the body. And two days after its discovery became public knowledge, the abandoned house mysteriously burned down. Ancient Tombs Archaeologists in Turkey have uncovered over 400 creepy tombs decorated with images of grapes and flowers cut into the rock that date back at least 1800 years. These tombs were crafted in the ancient Greek city of Blondus, right around the 2nd century AD. At the time, the city was actually under Roman occupation. There were still a few Greek colonists in the city, but it was fully under Roman control. The Romans were using these elaborate tombs to bury their family members, and they weren't ordinary burials, but likely involved specialized funeral ceremonies. The Romans created a huge complex with vaulted tombs with the whole crypt sealed behind a massive marble door. The only time anyone was allowed inside was during a burial ceremony. Of course, we don't know exactly what went on in these ceremonies. By the time archaeologists started excavating, the bodies had already been stolen, and everything except the creepy paintings on the walls had been pillaged. What happened to the bodies is anybody's guess, though it's hard to imagine why anyone would steal over 400 remains. Monster Skull In Canada's Yukon Territory, a miner accidentally dug up the fossilized skull of what is being described as an extinct monster. Stuart Schmidt was working near Dawson City when he uncovered the mysterious skull using heavy equipment. He noticed something bizarre sticking out of the gravel. He then climbed out of his machine and pulled the thing out with his hands. It turned out to be the almost perfectly preserved skull of an extinct North American helmeted muskox quite different to the modern tundra muskox, which looks a lot like a bison, in case you were wondering. 11,000 years ago, these animals were hunted by the first Native Americans who lived in Canada, eating and killing so many that they went extinct. But back then, these were huge monsters. They were about twice the size of a modern muskox, like mobile battering rams. These bulky giants weighed almost 1,000 pounds. After the discovery of the creepy skull, it was shipped off to paleontologist Grant Zazula with the territorial government. Scientists are now working to study the remains, hoping to carbon date the skull and do some genetic studies. What would you do if you found the prehistoric skull of a monster while at work? Would you hand it over to scientists or mount it on your wall? Let me know in the comments below and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Missing Tongue Archaeologists found the body of a man near the small British village of Stanwyck back in 1991. But it wasn't until just recently that Simon Mays, a human skeletal biologist, took a closer look at the mysterious skeleton. What he discovered is nothing short of horrifying. 
The skeleton is believed to be of a man who lived 1,500 years before today. He was discovered with a flat rock stuffed into his mouth. Why the rock was there was a mystery, but thanks to new advances in science, Simon and his team of researchers were able to determine that the individual suffered an oral infection at the time of death. The infection had spread to several other parts of his body which probably resulted in his death in the first place. In all likelihood, the infection stemmed from a previous tongue amputation. In other words, his tongue had been cut out of his mouth, his mouth had gotten infected, and that infection spread through his body and killed him. But to understand just how creepy this discovery is, we need to go back to the rock that was found in his mouth. According to live science, there have been multiple burials from between the 3rd and 7th centuries AD in Britain with some eerie similarities. Skeletons have been found with their heads missing, and in place of their head, a rock. Another skeleton with its foot missing had a pot put in place of the foot. The suggestion here is that for whatever bizarre reason, if a person was missing part of their body when they died, whoever buried them would replace it with a rock or a pot to symbolize the missing body part. The Parasite Speaking of missing a tongue, a horrifying parasite was recently discovered at Galveston Island State Park in Texas. The parasite is a type of creepy marine organism called a tongue-eating louse, or a snapper-choking isopod. It detaches the tongue of its victim and then takes its place. The discovery was made by Corey Evans, a fish biologist with Rice University. He had actually been researching skull shapes in different fish when he came across an Atlantic croaker with something bizarre in its mouth. It turned out to be a type of isopod that invades a fish through its gills. This tongue-eating louse worms its way through a fish's gills, latches onto the fish's tongue, and then drains it of its blood. It even erodes all the tongue's muscle tissue until there's nothing left except bone. The isopod then attaches itself to the base of the bone where the tongue used to be, thereby becoming the tongue of the fish. It feeds off mucus and tiny bits of whatever the fish eats. Both animals remain alive, the fish doesn't seem to care, and everyone lives a long and happy life, together. Still, this is incredibly creepy. According to Evans, these parasitic isopods are extremely common in the Gulf of Mexico. And even though a fish can live a full life with one of these parasites in its mouth, it sometimes will be infected by two parasites. A second isopod will move in through the gills, trying to get in on the first one's action. The fish will then have so many of these creatures in its mouth that it's unable to swallow its own food and starves in just a couple of weeks. Dakota Ghost Town An archaeological team working with the Nebraska State Historical Society may have just discovered the creepy remains of a cemetery that has been lost since the 19th century. In Dakota County near Omaha Creek, researchers are seeking further evidence of a cemetery once belonging to the town of Omadi. A few of the residents who had lived in the area for quite some time had heard stories about this long-lost Omadi cemetery, also known as Sand Ridge but there had never been any photographs, headstones, or any other evidence to confirm the stories. Omadi's founding in 1856 was more than 10 years before Nebraska was even a state. The population here peaked at about 400 citizens, but before long, the waters of the Missouri River started to wash the town away. Combined with the boom in gold mining in nearby Colorado, the population of the town dropped from 400 to only around a dozen. By 1865, Shortly after the town was founded, the place was a ghost town. All these years later, scientists finally decided to track down the abandoned cemetery used during the decade that Omadi was a booming village. It's estimated there are at least 30 people buried in the missing cemetery. The scientists had to use ground-penetrating radar over the plot of land where they believe the cemetery once stood. Today, the land is nothing but a field of grass where wildflowers grow. Unfortunately, the archaeologists are still investigating the radar images that they took, and while it does appear that something or someone is hidden underground here, there hasn't been any official announcements yet. Naked Shark In July of 2019, fishermen in the Mediterranean Sea were pulling in their nets when they discovered a rare, unusual, and creepy discovery. Among hundreds of fish, sharks, and a variety of other marine life, there was a blackmouth cat shark. Strangely, it had no skin or skin-related structures. It didn't even have any teeth in its mouth. This is extremely different from something like albinism, which is actually quite common. Scientists have found lots of sharks that have skin and pigmentation abnormalities, 
but this unusual naked shark is the first discovery of its kind, a living shark with no skin or teeth. And somehow, it was living a perfectly ordinary life before these fishermen rudely pulled it from its home in the sea. The fishermen handed the shark over to scientists who were able to determine it was three years old. It even had a belly full of food before the fishermen killed it. What's really baffling scientists now is how a shark with no teeth or skin managed to live for three years hunting other fish. It had a total of 14 food items in its stomach when researchers did the autopsy, including bony fishes, crustaceans, and even small cephalopods. Perhaps this is the world's only real-life gummy shark. Mummy and Skulls A truly creepy mummy was recently discovered in the ancient city of Luxor in Egypt, when its tomb was opened for the first time in 3,500 years. What made this mummy exceptionally creepy? It was surrounded by over 450 statues and funeral masks, as well as skulls and bones, coffin fragments, and more. According to the Egyptian antiquities minister, the tomb was probably made during the 18th dynasty, between the rule of King Amenhotep II and King Tutmos IV. Researchers don't actually know who the creepy mummy was during their life, but they are fairly certain it was someone important. They were definitely important enough that after being mummified and placed in their tomb, skulls of other people were left behind. Perhaps 3,500 years ago, the skulls were those of servants, sacrifices, or something else meant to keep the mummy company while they journeyed to the afterlife. There is still a great deal of the tomb that is unexplored, so we'll have to wait for more information to be revealed. The Frozen Dragon a new kind of flying reptile was discovered in the icy wastelands of Alberta, Canada in 2019. Paleontologists have called it a frozen dragon, an entirely new genus of pterosaur that lived alongside dinosaurs 76 million years ago. However, it didn't really live alongside them so much as it lived above them in the skies. This creature had a wingspan of at least 16 feet but could have grown as large as 33 feet. It lived in Western Canada and looked very much like our modern idea of what a dragon should look like. According to Mike Habib from the University of Southern California, the gigantic reptile lived at a time when the landscape of Canada was temperate. It was far warmer than Alberta is today and hosted a whole ecosystem of unique dinosaurs and early animals. And soaring above them in the clouds was the frozen dragon. The bones of this mysterious pterosaur were technically discovered three decades ago, but it was only a few years back that researchers confirmed the creature belonged to its own genus. It was one of the very first vertebrates that took to the sky, and it's related to other pterosaurs that were even bigger. For example, the Quetzalcoatlus was another flying reptile that grew double the size of the frozen dragon. Pterosaurs as a group were the closest we have ever come on this planet to having dragons roaming around. Our Ancient Brains A shocking new study has revealed some interesting information about our brains. We finally have some answers to the age-old questions. What makes modern humans unique? And what sets us apart from our primitive relatives like the Neanderthals? We know that modern humans split in development from our famous archaic ancestors, between 300,000 and 80,000 years ago. But why did we survive and they didn't? Scientists with the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics, or MPI-CBG, learned that modern humans evolved a single amino acid which increased the number of brain cells we could create. This small change eventually led to a cognitive separation between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, and this new study is offering the very first real proof that we as Homo sapiens were indeed smarter than Neanderthals. This discovery has come as a big surprise for a few reasons. Scientists have always been confused because our brains were almost identical in size to the brains of Neanderthals. Nobody understood how we managed to be so much more intelligent if we had the same brains. To make sense of this, scientists had to look at the genes from the Neanderthal brain. When they compared the gene TKTL1, which is involved in producing neurons, they found a very slight difference from modern human genes. In current Homo sapiens, the gene works to create neurons at a faster pace, giving us a more powerful frontal lobe. When the Neanderthal brain grew, the neurons were created too slowly to grant any superior intelligence. 
But when a single gene variation occurred, humans suddenly had massive cognitive ability because of an explosion of neurons. In the end, it all came down to the developmental process of the brain. Minerals on the Moon In September of 2022, a massive new discovery on the Moon was announced. China has just become the third country to discover a brand new lunar mineral. According to China's National Space Administration, researchers studying samples brought back from the Moon by their Chang'e 5 lunar probe found an entirely new mineral. It's the sixth new mineral to be found on the Moon, China's first, and it could have serious implications for the future of technology. The newly discovered mineral has been called Chang'esite Y and is currently being studied by a team from the Beijing Research Institute of Uranium Geology. This new mineral is a clear and colorless columnar crystal, but as of now, there is not really much to do with it. There is only a very small amount of this new material, and nobody is entirely sure what its properties could mean for science. However, finding new materials and minerals on the moon is a big deal. These minerals could wind up being as important as coal was in the Industrial Revolution one day. It's even possible that they could boost deep space exploration and help push forward potential settlements on the moon itself. Shark Scales and Human Teeth Researchers have just discovered fresh evidence that teeth may have evolved from the scales of sharks. This is wildly exciting because it could confirm the outside-in hypothesis, which suggests that as scales grew along an animal's body over millions of years, they gradually moved closer to the mouth of the creature. Eventually, the scales moved all the way into the animal's jaw and then became used for eating. They were such an evolutionary success that the scales transformed into teeth and became a staple for most animals we know today. A team from Penn State University may have just confirmed this hypothesis. Todd Cook and his colleagues did this by studying the tissue structure of rostral denticles, which are spikes inside the snouts of sawfish. They look like teeth, but aren't, and are used for foraging and self-defense. When the researchers looked to the fossil record, they found an example of an extinct sawfish from 100 million years ago. This revealed clear evidence that the rostral denticles started out as modified scales. What this implies is that teeth evolved as a side effect of scaly armor. Then, as animals continued to progress over time, teeth became a staple in evolution and were passed on to newly developed species humans included. Mythical Bronze Creature A mythical bronze creature has been unearthed in China at the mysterious archaeological site of San Qingdui. The relic is enormous, weighing 330 pounds and measured at about 3 feet long. It's currently the largest and most impressive bronze animal statue found in the area. San Qingdui was discovered in 1986 and has been linked to the vaguely understood Kingdom of Shu. They prospered in southwest China during the Bronze Age up until around 316 BC, when they vanished without a trace, never to pop up anywhere again. They left behind no written records, so not much is known about their history. All we have to go on are the thousands of relics excavated in their great city. Most of the artifacts found here are of weird animals, alien-like humanoids, and mythical beasts. They seem to have been a culture obsessed with myths and legends, as well as creating bizarre monsters. However, out of the 14,000 relics uncovered since the first excavation in 86, the giant bronze beast is the first of its kind. It was found in a sacrificial pit, and nobody is really sure what it is. The creature has a tree engraved on its chest, a single horn on its head, and doesn't look like anything alive today. Archaeologists still have no clue what the creepy bronze animal was ever supposed to be. Attack of the Megalodon Two fossilized vertebrae from the same prehistoric whale were discovered along Calvert Cliffs in Chesapeake Bay. The fossils date back 15 million years from the Miocene period. According to the researchers at the Calvert Marine Museum, the fossils belong to a rather small whale that was only about 13 feet long. However, what's both interesting and tragic is that the pair of fossils show that the animal was brutally injured 
and scientists believe the attacker was most likely a megalodon. The whale had its bones crushed by the intense force of the megalodon's bite, then went on living in great pain for two more months before it finally succumbed to its injuries. This is a spectacular discovery because it shows the physical remains of a megalodon attack victim. We have plenty of megalodon teeth, so many that kids frequently pull them out of rivers and find them on the beach. But to find the skeleton of an animal that had its bones crushed by the biggest shark that ever lived is extraordinarily rare. Researchers at the museum say the backbones of the whale were bent with such force that the pressure smashed their neighboring vertebra. It would have been a horrible injury for the whale, and it goes to demonstrate the unstoppable power of the megalodon. Kleinfelter Syndrome The oldest case of Kleinfelter Syndrome has officially been identified in a 1,000-year-old Portuguese skeleton. The person who it once belonged to had suffered from a serious and rare condition that gives men an extra X chromosome. The primary effect of the syndrome is infertility, with very little production capabilities in the male reproductive organ. The syndrome also gives the victim extraordinarily small and dysfunctional testes. It occurs in every 1,000 genetic male births and also has the unfortunate side effect of impacting motor skills and mental development. The syndrome was only diagnosed recently in 1942, and scientists don't know exactly what causes it. The only factor that seems to play a big role is if the baby is born from a mother over the age of 40. The condition is incurable, and it shortens the average lifespan of the victim by roughly 2.1 years. Today, only about 0.1% of the population has a chance of being born with the syndrome. However, 1,000 years ago in northeastern Portugal, in a small town with few people, one man developed Kleinfelter syndrome. Out of the 59 graves that were excavated at the Torre Velha necropolis, there was only one individual that suffered from this rare disorder. His skull showed significantly larger than normal teeth. He had a horrible gum condition that had ravaged the soft tissue of his mouth, and he was buried rather poorly. He was found in a shallow tomb, without a cover, and with no burial goods. Researchers don't know if this guy was an outcast in society, or if his unusual condition ostracized him from the rest of civilization. But the way he was buried is pretty telling. They also aren't sure why he developed this syndrome, or how far back in history it goes. Ant Raft If you're not sure what an ant raft is, it's a really bizarre phenomenon in nature. Whenever there's a storm and the ant's nest floods, they form huge floating blobs to stay alive on the surface of the water. In a new study, scientists tried to figure out the mechanics of these incredible biological lifeboats. This study was done by engineers at the University of Colorado Boulder. According to the primary investigator, Frank Verneri, Single ants are not as intelligent as people think they are. It's only when they work as a collective that they become frighteningly intelligent, putting together the brain power of the entire community. They conducted their experiment by dropping thousands of fire ants into a bucket of water and then watched for eight hours to see the evolution of the raft. Scientists were shocked to discover that the ants worked in harmony to construct a living boat. They found out that these ant rafts are made up of two layers. The bottom layer is a solid base of ants clinging to one another, creating a structurally sound platform. The second layer is made up of ants walking around on top of the platform like people walking on a ship's deck. Then, every so often, the ants on top would switch with the ants on the bottom to keep the whole thing going. Surprisingly, the engineers determined that it only takes a total of 10 ants to form one of these rafts. The ants are forced together using a fluid phenomenon known as the Cheerios effect. And when that force becomes too strong, they cling together and become buoyant enough to float on top of the water. Ancient Maya Settlement In late summer of 2022, archaeologists uncovered an ancient Maya settlement in central Belize. The settlement dates back 1,000 years and was identified in an old Mennonite farming community. Sadly, almost nothing is left of the settlement except white mounds of dust from where buildings once stood. About 300 years before the collapse of the Maya in 600 AD, the site was mysteriously abandoned. 
people had lived here for roughly 350 years, then packed up and left for unknown reasons. The archaeological evidence found here is scant at best. There are no pyramids, no plazas, and no temples that were used in human sacrifices. Instead, we see these sunken plaster foundations of houses that would have been inhabited by ordinary people. Researchers haven't found much more than vessels used for holding food and cooking supplies. This was an agricultural community, and they used the local landscape for growing crops and breeding animals. This unnamed settlement was what the real Maya civilization looked like outside the major population centers. Cities like Chichen Itza were huge and incredible with advanced architecture and tens of thousands of people. But that was the big city. However, the real backbone of Maya society lived out in the jungle on small plots of farmland just like this one. One very old tooth. Archaeologists in the country of Georgia have discovered a tooth that's roughly 1.8 million years old. The implications of this tooth are astounding. It belonged to an early species of human that may have lived in one of the first prehistoric human settlements outside Africa. The tooth was found near the rural village of Orosmani, about 60 miles from the capital of Tbilisi. It's the same place where human skulls dating back to around the same time were found in the 1990s. This is currently the oldest tooth ever found outside of Africa, proving that when humans migrated off the continent, they went straight to the South Caucasus. To really drive the point home on just how important this discovery is, we need to understand that the oldest human fossils come from Ethiopia and are 2.8 million years old. Scientists have also uncovered the remnants of tools dated roughly 2.1 million years old in China. However, the only truly ancient human remains outside Africa have been found in Georgia, making it a cradle of prehistoric human life. Georgia marks the beginning of humanity's domination of the planet. Thanks for watching! Which of these incredible new discoveries did you find the most fascinating? Let us all know in the comments below! And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already! See you soon! Bye!